Senator Zach Iskell is joining me now. So great to have you here on Picks and Politics. Thanks for coming back. Always great to be back. Thanks for having me. A lot to talk to you Good about. To you. And since you are part of the Adams administration, I yeah. want to begin with the big topic, which is the migrant crisis. Okay. Uh, and talk about the big change from the, the past week and the last time you were here. Individuals from Venezuela can now apply for work permits. The question is, while we know they can apply, is the word getting out that they themselves can go apply and are they yep. doing so? So first off, it's Venezuelans who uh, arrived in the country before July 31st. Mm -hmm. So folks that are coming to the city now post July 31st who cross the border after July 31st, it doesn't apply to them. But I'm very proud of what we're doing. The city has set up a lot of robust systems uh, to make sure that we are alerting people, we're doing screenings, we're talking to folks at the sites, we have teams that go out, yeah. actually screen for who is eligible, who is not. And it's not just TPS, it's also folks who have filled out the CBP-1 app um, or might have eligibility because they filed for asylum and then you're eligible for work But they're aware of it. After 150 days. We are doing so much work to get our, our to talk to people eye to eye, face to face, get their information, and then refer them to a number of clinics we've set up around the city we can actually help people fill out their paperwork. Okay, I wanna talk also about the right to shelter and how yeah. that may or may not change, right? Listening to the mayor, he has said it's in the court system right mm -hmm. now. We know that it's in the court system. If it were to change, right, and it would only apply to those who are already here in New York, not asylum seekers, would that alleviate some of the pressure on the system that you are dealing with on a daily basis? We'll see, we'll see. I mean, I think at this stage, it's sort of too early to tell. The mm -hmm. hope is, is that it would. I think it also just gives the city a lot more flexibility in our response and being able to pull some different types of levers in order to deal with this flow of people. I mean, we have 10,000 people a yeah. month coming to New York City. Uh, the costs are enormous. We spent $2 billion already. We expect to spend $5 billion this fiscal year alone. That's more than the budget of three of our biggest departments. Right. You know, it's, and so I think these types of things, it will help us have more tools to deal with this situation and possibly uh, be a little bit more flexible. Yeah, I know too early to tell, right? And we're still in the court system. Yeah. But say it did happen, yeah. uh, and then folks were still arriving. Do you, would it increase the street homelessness issue that you're also facing on a daily basis? So that's definitely not the intent. Yeah. And um, you know, the city and the administration has made clear that we still support Callahan. We still want to keep the right to shelter in place. Just during this massive humanitarian crisis, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work, right. right? And it's actually putting stress on the system for us to, to be able to take care of some of the city's most vulnerable. Okay. And I think the hope is, is that this would also reduce some of the pull factors that are bringing people to New York yeah. City. In addition to maybe it puts some additional pressure on the federal government for them to really step up and start doing their part uh, in this national, yeah. in fact, I'd argue, international crisis. And I want to talk about the, the, the peg cuts, so the 5% yeah. cuts, for those who don't know, uh, to every city agency, the mayor has kind of put that mm -hmm. out. With what we're seeing, when Office of Emergency Management yeah. has really been answering a lot lately in terms of storms, the crisis, and so on and so forth, how would you see cuts playing out within yeah. your department? So first off, um, I appreciate you saying that. I could not be more proud of our team. Mm -hmm. What our team has done over the past year, uh, the number of emergencies, the asylum seeker crisis, extreme weather events, um, you know, I served in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. I thought when I left the Marine Corps, I would never work with folks that have that sort of civic minded responsibility yep. and duty and that commitment. And I get to see it every day at my agency and I couldn't be prouder of, of the people I work with every day at New York City Emergency Management. Uh, in terms of the, the, the PEG, we're still looking at it. I think mm -hmm. one of the benefits of emergency management is, is a significant portion of our funding comes from grants. Okay. And so that alleviates some of the pain. But we're still looking at ways to go about those that PEG in a way that is not impacting our ability to serve New Yorkers. Yeah, because certainly after we saw the massive rainfall, let's pivot to that right now, right? Yeah. And you really need all hands on deck for a situation like that. Um, for sure. There has been a, a lot of talk about whether or not the city was prepared. Do you feel within your department, within the city, that everybody was ready, willing, and able to be well aware and versed on what was coming our yeah. way? So the city does a lot of work in the run-up to these types of events to prepare, and we were prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, we activated the city's flash flood plan. Uh, we started consultations with the National Weather Service. We brought in all of our agency partners on Thursday, the day beforehand, to start going through the checklist of, you know, making sure FDNY and NYPD are pre-staging, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, emergency medical services and sort of people that are first responders around the city. We're working with DEP, sanitation, Department of Transportation to make sure that we're clearing roadways, catch basins. Yeah. 
Uh, we're staging forestry crews around the city so that we can immediately respond to that. We're talking to Con Ed about having additional crews out there. There is a ton of work that goes into preparing the city. Mm -hmm. We got our travel advisory out Thursday afternoon. Um, and then I think when you look at the actual response that day, whether it was flooding and traffic backups on the Cross Island, mm -hmm. whether it was um, you know threats to life or property, I think when you look at our ability to respond, to clear those roadways, to preserve life, nobody was killed. Right. No serious injuries. So, and even when you look at damage, right, mm -hmm. you compare it to something like Ida. Uh, the remnants of Hurricane Ida, you know, 13 people died. Yeah. Uh, over 4,000 damage reports, significant, significant mm -hmm. damage. Um, that was a major event. This, we've had much less damage. Yes. And I will say it was a well-coordinated yeah. effort. I'm listening to you very carefully. It yeah. seems to be you might be leaving out one factor, which would be the New Yorker themselves. Were they in the know? <laughs> Well enough. There's been a lot of issues about communication, right? Whether mm -hmm. or not people have signed up for Notify NYC. The school chancellor said, "Look, we could have done better." Mm -hmm. Do you think the messaging to the everyday New Yorker could have been better? In hindsight, so I think, look, after every single one of these events, we do a hot wash, mm -hmm. right? We sit down and we say, "What could we have done better?" And I think one of the things in this time of extreme weather, and we are working very closely with our the National Weather Service yeah. and, and our federal partners up on this, is how do we communicate the dangers of extreme weather? Especially because it's not going to be once every 10 years anymore. Right. We, we're having 100-year floods, 1,000-year floods twice a year now. Yeah. And so I think one of the questions we have is, you know, if I say to the average New Yorker, you know, we're expecting uh, three to five inches of rain, you know, locally higher amounts over mm -hmm. six inches with rainfall rates of two to three. That doesn't mean anything. Over, yeah. And I think one of the things that we are working on now is how do we do a better job of articulating how that translates to impacts on the ground, to right. what it might mean for your morning commute, right. to what it might mean for, you know, your day, to the types of things that you might need to do to prepare for the types of weather. And there's a lot of work that needs to go mm -hmm. into that public messaging. Mm -hmm. I will say, after Ida, we started doing a ton of work, yeah. working with local organizations, community-based organizations, working communities. About a month ago, we did this great event out in Jackson Heights, most diverse community in the world, mm -hmm. handing out flood alarms and warning okay. sensors and teaching people and giving them the information they need to stay safe, which includes, I know we got to go, signing up for Notify, Notify NYC. NYC yeah. If I plug didn't it. plug Notify NYC, I, I wouldn't be doing my job. But you can sign up by going to 311. It's available in 14 yeah. languages, including American Sign Language. You can download the app or go to nyc.gov backslash notify. I appreciate you always coming on. And it is important to point out that there were zero fatalities in that storm. But Commissioner, great to have you here once again. Great on to be here. Politics. Thank you.